and amen. I want you to open up your Bibles with me here, the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and uh, I want to just dive into this here because in this series we've been in, the enemy is, is just, he's running rampant in our world today. We see so much going on, and I just, with all the events that's been going on the last few weeks with Israel, Hamas, all that's going on in the Middle East, uh, I mean, gosh, we've had earthquakes, we're having hurricanes, I mean, crazy stuff. You know, it just seems like that we're living in the last days, anybody else with me? And it just makes me more aware than ever before uh, that we, 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 we better be ready. Make sure our life is ready, right? You know, we've used what Paul said in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, well, he is encouraging the church there it's been encouragement to us that we can't be ignorant of the enemy's devices, of his schemes, of his plans. Man, God's a good God. How many of y'all know that? And he's good all the time. I don't know about you, but man, the older I become, the more I appreciate God's goodness in my life. Come on, God's good all the time. Come on, he's good all the time. Look at your name and tell him God's been good to me. We know in God's goodness that there's also an enemy of our soul out there that God has good things planned for us. He's got life for us, but the enemy also has a plan, and that's to do what? To steal, to kill, and to destroy. And as we wrap up the series here today, I just want to really nail down for the few moments we got left here just a couple of quick thoughts. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we're going to pick up on this first thought because you can write this down in your notes, and if you're tracking along in the notes, the point one is this, that we are, we are all building our life on something. There's a foundation to our life. There is history in our life. There's, there's the things we've learned in our life through education. There's our traditions we've learned uh, growing up in the particular home that you've in. There's our ex life experiences. But these, all these produce a foundation that our life is being built upon. And I want you to see something that Paul addresses in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. It starts out in verse 9, and he says this. I'm reading out of the New King James. He says, for we are all, excuse me, for we, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are, and I love the way he says this, you are God's, everybody say it with me, what? Building. Come on, everybody say, I'm God's building. Okay, there's a building. God has built something in us, right? Verse 10, according to the grace of God, which was given to me, Paul says, he says, as a wise master builder, he says, I have laid the foundation." And another builds up on that. And, of course, that's kind of in reference to the verses before where he's talking about the divisions in the churches. How some claim there was of, Paul, of Apollo. Some said there was of Paul. He said, man, he says, you know, I, I planted Apollos water, but God gets the increase, okay? He goes on to say this. He says, according to the grace of God given to me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds upon it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. Do you see the... The word picture, the, 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 the picture that's being created, the analogy here Paul's talking about, about building something. We all understand the principle of building, correct? Whenever we built this church building, this church building that you're getting to experience on, you're sitting on a chair that sits on a cement slab that sits on several layers of dirt that's been compacted over time. You couldn't have the cement floor without the foundation. You couldn't have the chair upon the carpet, upon the cement floor without a strong Foundation. So this is what Paul's really referring to, something being built. Again, we all build our life on something, okay? So let's jump down to verse 12. Verse 12, Paul says it this way. He says, now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones. Now he didn't stop there. Now gold's pretty cool, right? <laughs> silver, come on, that's, woo, come on now, silver. Precious stones, that's cool. Come on, anybody like diamonds, you know what I'm saying, you know? But he also, in the same sentence, he talks about also wood, hay, and straw. Look what he says in verse 13. Each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by, everybody say this with me, what? Fire. Fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. In other words, we know that Gold, silver, what happens to gold, silver when it's put to the fire? It becomes pure, stronger, more valuable, right? What happens to wood? What happens to hay? What happens to stubble when it's put to the fire? Come on, what it is, what it does, it, whoo, it's gone, right? So 
so we see here, jump down to verse uh, 13 again. He says, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it. Now jump down to verse 16. Jump down to verse 16. Verse 16. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells, what does it say, where? Come on, dwells. Come on, put your hand on your heart and say he dwells right here. That the spirit of God dwells in you for verse 17 says, if anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Verse 18, look. Let no one deceive himself. Let me say that again. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. And I'm just going to stop right there. But I believe this is so critically important to the subject matter that we're on here today. Again, just to reiterate what I said a moment ago, we're all building something. There's a foundation to our life. We're all building a life. We're building our family, or maybe you're building a marriage, or maybe you're building your, a literal business, or whatever it may be. You know, we're building our church. You know, we're building our communities. We're all building something. And this passage clearly identifies to us that in the building of this, there's some good things probably, right? Come on, how many of y'all are married? You got some good things in your marriage. There's like, whoo, this is good. Anybody? I'm not real encouraged by your response today. Come on, you're building your family. How many of y'all got some good things happening in your family? Anybody here today? Hey, come on. How many of y'all got some good things happening in your business, right? Come on. We got some good things happening in our church, right? That was a kind of provoking, hopefully get a good response for that. There's some good things. But again, we see in this foundation that Paul talks about, we've got to identify, yeah, there are some good things, but could there be some unstable things? Could there be some fleshly things? Could there be some things that maybe aren't quite right? And now I need us to understand some basic principles here of theology. My life in Christ, your relationship with Jesus Christ, let's think about that for just a moment. How is your relationship with Jesus Christ, okay? Okay. Your relationship with Jesus Christ, my life, you hear me say this many times, my life in Jesus, it's perfect. Come on, I can't be any more saved than I am right now. All my good works don't get me any more saved. I'm not saved by works, it's only by faith. Through faith, not works, am I saved? Come on, how many of y'all are saved today and you know Jesus, let me hear you. You're glad about it, right? My life in Jesus, I am perfect. Jesus isn't gonna come back down to this earth and die on the cross again to pay the price for my sins because when he did it, it was done. You don't have to do it again. So in Jesus, man, I'm good. In Jesus, I'm a son. Come on, ladies, in Jesus, you're a daughter. Come on, in Jesus, we're good. Here's the challenge. How much of Jesus, though, is living in me? Ooh, that lies the work. That lies the challenge. That lies... In that thought lies what Paul is identifying in my life because if Tammy was here, I could say, you know, I've been married to this gorgeous woman for 35 years and I've done, I'm doing a whole lot better. The last half has been a whole lot better than the first half. Woo, come on. She's not here so I can blow my own horn right now. Man, the last year has been better than the previous years. I'm getting better. I'm getting better. She would also probably say, but he's still got some work to do in some certain areas, right? I'm not perfect. I'm not the perfect husband, but I am doing better. Even though I don't have grown kids, excuse me, kids in my home, all my kids are grown. I'm still a parent. I get to be a grandparent. In fact, I've got Caden. Caden has been in my care for the last, since uh, three o'clock on Saturday morning till this afternoon. He's been in my care and I'm finding myself after service like, wait a minute, I've got a kid I'm responsible for. Where's he at? It's a good thing he's a church kid because y'all are all responsible for Caden. Till he gets in my truck and goes home, okay? Just for the record, I wanted to say that. Has anybody, where is Kate, by the way? <laughs> okay, Aunt Brittany, Aunt, the fun aunt, Brittany's got him, okay. Whew. But I've got work to do. I'm not perfect of Jesus living in me. I've still got to, it's kind of like John the Baptist responded to his disciples when his disciples come back to him and says, man, who, hey, this Jesus fella, he's getting a whole lot more fame than we've got. Anybody remember what John said? He said, I've got to decrease 
so that he can increase. I've got to decrease so that he can. That really needs to be our prayer of this whole. See, my life in Jesus, that's my justification, but how much of Jesus is living in me, that's the sanctification process. That's the transformation process that I've got to walk through. So in other words, being transformed more into the image of Jesus Christ, I've got to realize, man, there's some gold, there's some silver, there's some precious stones inside of me. But there's probably also, I hate to admit it, some wood, some hay, some stubble, some things I need to work on. Anybody else with me here at World Harvest Church? Come on, I want you to look at your neighbor and tell them, I've got some stuff I need to work on. Come on, tell somebody that. Say, I've got some stuff inside of me. It is, listen to this, it is self-deception. Listen to me. I know y'all are having some fun with that. I shouldn't have told you to do that. It is self-deception to think that we don't need any work on our life, that we don't need to work on our life. See, self-deception emerges from living a, listen to this, a self-referential-based life. See, for me to realize that I need some work, what's my reference point? What's my frame of reference for how I'm doing? And this is the, thus the problem we have in our American culture. This is the problem when we take Jesus out of the center. This is the problem whenever we begin to justify our life. It's called being self-righteous. I am okay. In fact, we see the writer in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 2, so boldly makes this statement that I see as a big problem in our culture today where the, it's penned this, every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the hearts. Every man's way, and so the whole problem with self-deception is this, it's very deceiving. And we see ourselves as being okay so many times, but we fail to realize that it's not everybody else around us that's got the problem. Many times it's myself that I've got some stuff in me that I need to work out. Thus, the philosophy we embrace at World Harvest Church, when it comes to walking your life out, you draw a circle around your life. You work on everything in that circle, <laughs> You do what you can do. You control what you control. But what you can't, you got to trust God with that. You got to draw the circle around yourself first because this is what Paul is identifying in this foundation, the gold, the silver, the precious stones. Woo! But there's also the wood, the hay, the stubble. Amen? The wood, the hay, the stubble. There. See, and... and in our world, we got to understand if my core of my life, my basis of truth, is based upon, and I'll teach on this more when we get into January, the Lord's stirring some stuff here. But my core, my basis of truth that I stand on is really, it, it is based upon my education, what I've learned, what I've been taught, good and bad. Come on, the ways I've been taught the word of God, whether I've been taught the right or the wrong of the word of God, okay, right? Jonathan talked about manipulating the word of God last week. It, it, it comes from our traditions, those things we learn in our home. It comes from our life experiences. Now, our life experiences, a majority of Christian people, okay, yeah, a majority of people, let me just say it this way, has experienced at some point in their life some trauma, a traumatic event. Maybe it was a loss of a loved one. Maybe it was abuse by an outside source. Maybe things internal or external. We've all probably experienced some type of trauma in our life. Now, here's the problem. If we don't properly deal with the traumatic events of our life, it creates the wood, the hay, the stubble in our life, and it affects the way we do things for the rest of our life. The hurt, the pains, the struggles that you experience, if you don't take it to the cross, what tends to happen when we suffer traumatic experiences in our life, we tend to just put a Band-Aid over it. We tend to try to... Self-deception, try to make it okay. Try to, but let me tell you, you will never be okay. You'll never truly be okay until you take it to Jesus fully and 100%. You will find healing at the cross. Amen. Come on, you'll find healing at the cross. And this is why this is so critical. And church, I wish I had more time to dive into this today. But a whole problem in our human nature is this. We keep participating in the original sin of the Garden of Eden. 
Y'all remember the original sin? What happened? God said, you can have of all the guard, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil don't partake of. But we know we talked about the scam of sin, how the enemy come in, tempted, t- tempted Adam and Eve. They fell into the trap of sin. I want you to see something G- that, that God himself said in Genesis chapter 3, verse 22. God himself said, after the fall of man, he said, then the Lord God said, he said, behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put his hand and take also the tree of life and eat it and live forever, he went on and he drove him out of the garden. This is the problem, I believe. Our responsibility lies in our own circle, taking care of ourselves. But human nature wants to take care of everybody else instead of ourselves. We want to become the judge of others. I truly believe that mankind was never meant to be the judge of others. Because when we are the judge, we're taken, taken. He says here, man has become like us to know what? Good and evil. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, he says, judge not lest you be judged. Church, we, what, we, we, let's, let's work on ourselves. Let's, let's work on the foundation. This is what I want to drive home on this. You know, we, we've got to work on this self-deception that I'm okay and everybody else is wrong. And I tell you, it sounds funny to say, but how many people in our world, they're living their life that way? <sighs> That's some reason why I have some problems with some political people. That are always blaming others and taking responsibility for themselves. And I'm going to shut up right there. I did not intend to go there. (sighs) Come on, we got to work on ourselves. Come on, everybody say, I'm going to work on myself. So what's the answer to this? How do we stop self-deception? Right? To overcome self-deception, we got to stop judging ourselves according to our own standards. Our own standards. We we got to hold our heart up to God and ask Him to reveal anything that is deceiving us, to reveal any self righteousness, to reveal anything in us that is not pleasing to Him. And James chapter one, James chapter one. I need you to see this scripture here. James chapter one verse twenty two says this: "Be doers of the word of God." I'm curious, how many of y'all really love the word of God at World Harvest? How, how many of y'all really love the word of God? The degree that you really love the word of God can be, ter- be determined by how much of the word of God that you're living in, that you're doing. Let me say that again. The degree of the word that you really love and value, if it's a core value to your life, the word of, word of God, then we should be able to see evidence of that in your life. You should be living your life according to the word of God. This is what James addresses. But be you doers of the word and not what? Just hearers only. Church, American American churches are full of people who just hear the word of God, but not doers of the word of God. He says this, let me start again. But he, but be doers of the word of God and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. You see that? Deceiving yourselves. Verse 23, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a, everybody say it with me, what? Not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself He goes away, and immediately he forgets what kind of a man that he was. I love this example of a mirror. Come on, I've got a mirror here on the stage. and What's the purpose of a mirror? Oh, you know, what does a mirror do? I mean, it reflects, right? This is a mirror. I know just because of the reflection of the lights, I'm going to turn it this way. But a mirror, it's incredible to me because James writes this. He says, he that's a doer of the word... He's as a man that looks into the mirror. Now, the purpose of the mirror is to reflect the image that is before it, right? Reflects the image that is before it. Now, this is just phenomenal to me. Do you realize that you have never actually seen your own face? You've only seen what? A reflection. The only part of my face that I've actually ever seen is these two side parts of my nose. And every once in a while, I get these little gray hairs that run out there and just drives me crazy. Got to twist on the tweezers, pull those hairs. Anybody else got those problems? No, that's, I'm, I'm digressing. I'm digressing. But the only image of me that I've ever seen is what I see reflected in the mirror. 
right? Come on, how many of y'all used a mirror this morning? Anybody? Come on, some of y'all probably should have looked in the mirror. <laughs> Come on, because when you look in the mirror, what's the purpose of you looking in the mirror? You look in the mirror, why? I could guarantee you the reason why you're looking in the mirror is probably to see what needs to be adjusted with what is seen. Come on, you look in the mirror, your hair's all messed up. I mean, what do you do? You fix it if you're, unless your hairstyle's the messed up kind. But come on, you look in the mirror, you see boogers hanging out of your nose. What are you going to do? Hopefully you're going to correct it. I don't want to see no boogers hanging out of your nose, right? Come on, you do know how you make a Kleenex dance, right? Put a little boogie in it. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. But isn't it beautiful that James says that the word of God is that mirror? It's that mirror. Listen to this out of the Passion Translation. Passion Passion Translation says it this way. Don't just listen to the word of truth and not respond to it. I like that. There's a response that we've got to have when we expose our life to his word. He says, for that is the essence, the essence of self-deception. So always let his word become like poetry written and fulfilled by your life. Verse 23, if you listen to the word and don't live out the message that you hear, you become like the person who looks in the mirror of the word to discover the reflection of his face in the beginning. Verse 24, you perceive how God sees you in the mirror of the word, but then you go out and forget your divine origin. Verse 25, but those who set their gaze deeply into the perfecting law of liberty, they are fascinated by and respond to the truth that they hear and are strengthened by it They experience God's blessing in all that they do. See, my responsibility in this thing to combat self-deception is I need to expose myself to the word of God on a regular basis. Just as every morning before I leave the house, I look into the mirror. When I get home, I look in the mirror. When I'm getting ready to do something important, I look in the mirror. Church, do you really value the word of God? If you value it, we've got to look into the word of God and let the word reflect back to us. Don't just read the word. Let the word of God read you. The word of God. Let me show you how this worked in my life. Many of y'all that have been with us for a while know that Tammy and I, we had a year from hell in 2008. Pre-2008, I heard a minister say, everybody has a year from hell. And I was like, ah, I rebuke that. I don't believe that. Then 2008 hit. (laughs) Just, I'm I'm not going to tell you a lot of the story because some of y'all have heard it before and it's not about the story. It's just, we had, in 2005, gotten involved in a business outside of the church, just entrepreneurial mindset, got involved in this business, uh, gotten into a partnership with a relative of ours and this relative had a lot of expertise in this area was messing with and And so long and short of the story was this, the business tanked. The crash of 2008, the depression of 2008, our business got caught in the middle of that. And because our name was still on the line, we were the one that got left holding the bag. And I've been pretty much a Christian. I'm I'm one of these people that if I didn't know any better, I think I was born at the altar at the church and got saved the moment I came out of my mama's womb. That's just kind of my life. Grew up in a pastor's home. Now, I wasn't perfect. I want you to understand, I wasn't perfect. But I've always led this life with the knowledge of Jesus Christ and walking with him. And so, in 2008 was my year of the fire. First Corinthians chapter 3, where I just read the fire. Where it's, what the foundation you got in your life is going to be tested by the fire. That was my fire. It was tested. Now, if you asked me pre-2008, how you doing? I'm like, I, you know, I'm really good. I've served God, I've been a tither, I've been a giver, I believe in the word of God all my life. I am really good. 2008 hit. And when all this began to crash and begin to burn, I still had this mindset, well, I'm a good kid, never done anything wrong. God is gonna keep me from any harm coming to me. Clear up, I, I was called into court and, and had to do these fight, all this stuff that I, I had had this, self-righteousness that I'll never have to go through anything like that in my life. Everything that I thought I would never have to do, I had to do. 
It's where I learned, that it's through 2008, I learned several principles. One of the principles is that I learned very boldly was this, that sometimes God keeps you from the fire. Sometimes he goes with you through the fire. Mm. We went through the fire, but bless God, he went with us through the fire. 2008 is a year I never want to repeat. I do say this, though, I am better, a better person, I'm a better pastor, because of all the hell I went through in 2008. I'm a better business person. I'm, I'm just better. I'm better because of the fire. Because there were some things burned up in the fire. There was some wood. There was some hay. There was stubble that was burned up in the fire. I wouldn't have chose it. Wouldn't have signed up for that trip. I, by no means. I didn't want to go through it. But I went through it. And, of course, it's kind of weird for me to say today, here we are, you know, 2023, all those years ago. But it's still devastating, even as I tell the story. But I came out of that. Whew, thank God got out of that. You know, and I continued to preach the word of God just with boldness because it didn't have nothing to do with the church. It was all to do with the business outside of the church. I remember about a year or two after that, I was up preaching, preaching about how you got to forgive those who do you wrong. <laughs> I'll never get it walked off the stage. And the Lord says, you know, you got to forgive your relative for that fiasco of 2008. First of all, like, I already forgave him. And this is what the Holy Spirit said. What goes off inside of you when you hear his name? And he just kind of whispered his name like, Arr. it was a trigger. It triggered my emotions. Arr. I mean, I wish we had the church security team back then like we have now because I could have sent some people. Come on, don't tell me y'all never had those thoughts before, right? I could have, I, knew, I know some people now. So I'm glad I didn't know some of y'all back then. But the Lord said, you got to forgive. Well, Lord, I did. And he said, what are you? And I was like, I began to observe that. Every time I'd hear this previous partner's name, I just like, man, I just, just emotion just well up inside of me. And just the enemy played that little reel in my head, how much of a victim I was, how much it was his fault, how much it was he did to me. And I remember preaching that message on forgiveness and I was like, Lord said, you're gonna have to forgive. And I finally came to the point and says, yeah, you're right, Lord, you're right. So I remember having a moment with the Lord, sit down, I had a very serious moment because I didn't want anything to hinder what God was doing to me. So I had a moment, I said, God, I forgive him. And I called out his name, I forgive him. I forgive him and I legitimately forgive him. And it was amazing to me the burden that lifted off of me. See, I thought it was all about him, but it was all about me. And I forgave him. And this is when I learned the principle of this. To forgive is an act. It's a moment in time. It's kind of like our people that got baptized. That's a moment in time that anytime the enemy comes back to whisper in their ear, well, you're really not saved, they can go back to that moment in time, knowing October 29th, 2023 at World Harvest Church. I got baptized. That's a mark of time. That's an act. That's where I learned to forgive is an act, but forgiveness is a journey that you got to walk. Because I wish I could say I forgave, and all of a sudden I had the divine amnesia and everything. Woo! And I wanted to go party with that guy again and go on vacations. Like, uh uh-uh, uh, uh uh, no. But I learned I had to remember every time the enemy had whispered those things and those feelings, I said, no, I forgive. I forgive. You know what the rest of that story is? Today, that person that I thought so victimized me is now some of our best friends. We go on vacations together now. You know what I call that? God's grace, his mercy. And that wood and the hay and the stubble being burned out of me. Amen. That's my story. Well, I thought I was good. I thought I was great. I thought I was the victim. And that whole process of forgiveness, the Lord showed me where I made some wrong moves. And I should have made some decisions I didn't. But let me tell you, church, you're not a victim. Come on, you're victors. You're victors in this place. Amen, I want you to stand to your feet with me here. Y'all all right today? Come on, you glad you came to church today? I can't help but think about Psalms chapter 51 in this moment. David, one of the greatest kings, you hear David mentioned so many times, he fell under the trap of self-deception. Later on in his years, he should have been out fighting battles, but he stayed back and ended up falling into sin. 
wasn't some random sin. I believe it was all premeditated because the sin he committed was with the wife of one of his best friends, somebody he'd been doing life with, one of his mighty warriors. Committed sin with Bathsheba. He ended up committing murder, killed her husband. And he was, if you would ask him, how you doing? He said, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Finally, Nathan, the prophet, showed up and told him a story that he understood about a little sheep that enraged David to the point that Nathan turned to him and says, you're that man. You've committed a grievous error. David broke when his sin was exposed. He broke. At some point after that, he penned the words of Psalms chapter 51. Let me pull out one verse of Psalms chapter 51, verse 10. David said this. He said, create in me a clean heart. Oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. I think that's the way we need to close this service today. Lord, create a clean heart in us. See, if there's anything in me that I need to get corrected, I want to know it. I want to expose it so that God can heal it, right? So I want you to bow your head with me and cross this sanctuary and this closing moments of this service. And I want us to say a prayer together. If you so choose to make this bold prayer, just repeat this after me. Say, Lord, my life is yours. Expose in me anything of wood, hay, or stubble. I don't want anything in my life to be displeasing to you. Come on, keep saying this. Say, Lord, I bring you my hurt and my pain. I bring you my own ideology. I bring you all of my life. I lay it up on the altar before you. Come on, boldly say this. Say, Lord, burn up what's of the flesh, but those things that are of you, the gold, the silver, the precious stones, purify them. May my life be reflective of who you are. Come on, say this. Say, create in me a clean heart, Lord. Do your work in me. I want all of you in my life. Come on, say this. Say, may may my life be a bright light shining in this dark world. In Jesus' name. Come on, you really believe that today? Amen. Amen. Exposing the devil's scams. The scam of self deception self-deception amen a prayer team I'm going to ask you to come at this time if you're here this morning and you need prayer for anything in your life we've got people here at the front that love to pray with you you're dealing with something maybe you've got a family member dealing with something or maybe just you just got some prayer some specific, anything specific you got, we've got a team here at the front that wants to pray with you you can feel free to come at this time or you can wait till Pastor Brittany dismisses us and come then The main thing is, don't go with those back doors. If you need prayer, you come down here to the front. The most important question, too, I can ask you is this. Do you know Jesus? Is your life right with Jesus? Is it right with him? Have you surrendered to him? I'm not talking about do you know him in your head. I'm talking about have you surrendered in your heart and have a heart relationship with Jesus Christ? Maybe you did it one time, but maybe you've let just the stuff of life pull you away from that relationship. Okay? Maybe Maybe you just need a recommit, all right? I'm not, I'm not here to debate theology with you. I'm just saying you just need to come home, all right? You just need to reconnect with Jesus, all right? If that's you, would love to pray with you. In fact, if that's you, if you never surrendered your life to Jesus or you just like to just to make a fresh commitment to him, if that's you, just raise your hand real quickly and put it right back down. Is there anybody here today that just might like to make a fresh commitment? Okay, didn't see any hands. Church, I want you to know there's a world out there beyond the four walls of this church that needs Jesus. We're waiting for you to go get him. Amen. I love you guys. Brittany, let you wrap us up.